Testing. Is that easy on the ears? Yeah? Bilal, look at the faces. They're nodding. It's good. Yeah? Nod. Good? Yeah, I think it's all right. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. My brothers, sisters, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sorry for skipping last week. We had something uh, on. Uh, for those of you who haven't been here, we've started a new series about the biography and the lives of the four great caliphs, the Khulafa al-Rashidun, the rightly guided caliphs. And what better than to go back and look at the lives of the great companions, the great standards of how we practice our religion in our life and how, we, how a Muslim lives his or her life. And the best examples were the prophets and those who lived around them, their students who learned directly from them. They are called the Sahaba, the companions of all the prophets. Jesus Christ, alayhi salam, Isa, alayhi salam, had companions of his own. So did Moses. So did all of them. Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi salam, also had companions. And he advised us and said, follow my sunnah and also continue following the sunnah of the rightly guided caliphs after me. Because Allah had guided them, they lived what they learned from the Prophet ﷺ in their normal daily lives, in all avenues of life. Yes, it was 1,400 years ago, but when we learn about their lives, we find that they are so distinguished. They're not like talking about other historical figures in history. They are nothing like them. And we know so much detail about their life. It's been carried on generations after generations. We have the best examples in the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We've already spoken about Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Umar radiallahu anhu. And last, in our last class, I spoke about how Uthman radiallahu anhu was elected and how Umar radiallahu anhu laid down the foundations of how the next leader would come about without their becoming a conflict between the people and a battle. And subhanAllah, it was amazing. And I spoke a little bit as an introduction to the life of Uthman radiallahu anhu, the third Khalifa of Islam. The first one is Abu Bakr, then Umar, then Uthman radiallahu anhu. So today I'm going to continue the life of Uthman radiallahu anhu, the first half of his life insha'Allah taking off from where we left off. So my brothers and sisters, Uthman radiallahu anhu was a very wealthy man, a great companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him. The fourth person to convert, to, to believe in the Prophet sallallahu and embrace Islam. Among the ten promised paradise, the first to write the verses of the Qur'an, the first, with his right hand. And Uthman radiallahu anhu, the angels are shy when he's around. This is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said in hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. Afala astahi min rajulin tastahi minhu al-mala'ika. How can I not be shy in front of a man whom the angels are shy of? Uthman radiallahu anhu was very handsome, very nice to look at. His voice was pleasant to the ear and he had beautiful eyes. Uthman radiallahu anhu was of a noble family. He came from a noble Arab lineage. Everybody loved him. He was the type that when he walked and talked, everybody loved him. Nobody had any beef with him. Muslim, non-Muslim, everybody loved him. Uthman radiallahu anhu had a pleasant presence. He didn't talk much. He wasn't a good public speaker. But he was definitely very sharp and decisive. He hardly ever was confused between two decisions and he made his decisions very quickly. So Uthman radiallahu anhu was something else. Uthman radiallahu anhu uh, says the following words about himself. Actually, I'd like to read what he said about himself radiallahu anhu. <clears throat> he said, Ten things I liked to keep between me and my Lord. I am the fourth to embrace Islam. I have never lied in my life. My right hand never touched my private part since shaking the hands with the Prophet ﷺ. No Friday 
passed except that I freed a slave. He would buy a slave and freed him or her. I never committed fornication before Islam nor after I became a Muslim. Fornication means zina. I prepared the army of Usra. We're going to talk about that today. The Prophet ﷺ married me to his first daughter. Then he married me to his second daughter. Ruqayya, then Umm Kulthum. We will talk about that today. I never stole before Islam nor after Islam. So this is basically Uthman radiallahu anhu as you can see from the beginning before he became a Muslim what his character really was. And when the Prophet وسلم, used to be asked about who, were, who became the best of the companions after becoming a Muslim, he would say they were the ones who had the best character when they were non-Muslims. They became the best character in Islam. And there is a lesson here, brothers and sisters, that a person's personality and character that they grow up with, even if they are Muslim and they become religious, some of it doesn't really go away from you. Some habits do stay. Some people may have an anger issue. But what a Muslim does is that they ch channel that anger in the right direction. It doesn't really go away. Some people have other problems in their habits or their character. The companions is to teach us how to channel it in the right direction. So some people when they become Muslim or some people when they want to become religious and they still have personalities and traits that they are stuck with, they need to work on it because that can make you become an extremist in Islam or it can make you become a very a person who waters down Islam or lazy in Islam or judgmental or good or bad. So your personality and character always needs to be worked on. For the Prophet, peace be upon him, did say, I have in fact, as a matter of fact, he says, as a matter of fact, I have been sent to complete the virtues of good character. That's the whole purpose. Some brothers and sisters, young people, they ask me, how do I motivate myself to pray? Allah says in the Quran, pray your salat, for salat prevents you from mischief and immorality. They say to me, how do I make myself motivate myself to salat? The answer to that, brothers and sisters, really, salat is the motivator. It's meant to be the other way around. Salat is the key. It's like saying, how do I open the door? I say, grab the key. You don't ask me, how do I motivate myself to grab the key? The key is the way to the door. Salat is the key to character and motivation. When you start your salat, your iman rises. Some people, they wait for that something magical to come down, and then they get an epiphany. Now it's time to pray. My brothers and sisters, actually, salat is the step you have to make. And then the salat will help your iman. You'll find your iman rise. You become more conscious, more God-fearing. But you've got to do it really because you want to. Right? Even if you feel lazy or down. It's nothing. When I first started salat when I was 14, well, I started when I was a little kid, but I was on and off until I was 14. This is quite typical of teenagers that your parents keep reminding you. And one day I made a decision. And one thing I did, I don't know if you want to use it, I put a stopwatch and I said, let me see how long it takes me to pray. I was about 14 that time. It took me 4 minutes and 20 seconds. I still remember. And if I went to the masjid, it took me about 6 minutes. I thought, wow, it takes me longer than that to just walk in my backyard. It takes me longer than that to sit down and look at my uh, play with a game for a little bit before time passes. It takes me longer than that to just go and get a drink of water. So it's not really taking up much of your time. Brothers and sisters, how do you pray? By praying. You have to make that step so long as you are healthy and able to, inshallah, and you'll see the benefits of it. Brothers and sisters, this man, Uthman radiallahu anhu, his nickname was Dhun-Nurayn. Dhun-Nurayn means the man of the two eminent lights. The man of the two radiant lights. Why was he called the man of the two radiant lights? Because he was the only man in history, in this entire world, from beginning to end, who ever married two daughters of one single prophet. Uthman al was the only man who married two daughters of any prophet. And the story of his marriage 
to the Prophet Sallallahu daughters were like this. The Prophet, peace be upon him, had four daughters. Zainab was the oldest, radiallahu anha, followed by Ruqayya, radiallahu anha, followed by Umm Kulthum, radiallahu anha, and the youngest was Fatima al-Zahra, radiallahu anhum ajma'in. Uthman radiallahu anhu had always had his eye on Ruqayya. He always liked her, but he never showed it because he was shy and a man of self-respect. And before Islam, before he became a Muslim and before Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became a prophet, they were betrothed, his daughters, both of them were betrothed to the Prophet's first cousins his uncle Abu Lahab's two sons, Abu Lahab. But when the verse of the Qur'an came down, the chapter, Tabbat yada Abi Lahabin wa tab, may the hands of Abu Lahab be cursed because of his enmity and what he did to the Prophet ﷺ and his wife, Abu Lahab and his wife became so angry that they wanted to hurt, he wanted to hurt his nephew in any, any way. The first things he did to hurt his nephew, among the um, manipulations and among the degradations and the insults that he gave him, was that he told his two sons, I am not your dad, I disown you if you marry his daughters to his two sons. And so his two sons divorced, so that they hadn't actually consummated the marriage, it was just contract, they hadn't moved in together yet. And his children, his two sons, divorced the Prophet ﷺ's daughters. In those days, he divorced a woman. It was tough because it, it, people survived through marriage. And women didn't have the ability, the independence like they have today. And it was hard. And to divorce them meant that something's wrong with them or they're not very desired. That's how the culture was. So they, he wanted to hurt the Prophet Sallallahu and make it look like, for no particular reason, his daughters are not worthy of his own sons. And Abu Lahab was a big leader. He was a respected, wealthy person. The Prophet Sallallahu was hurt by that, but at the same time, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala then sent some verses of the Qur'an down saying, anyway, a believing man is far greater than a disbelieving man or husband, and a believing woman, wife, is far better than a disbelieving wife, even if you are attracted to them. For one calls to one way, and the other calls to Allah. Then Uthman radiallahu anhu saw an option here. He saw a way. And Allah had willed it for his daughters to marry even better. Uthman radiallahu anhu went and proposed to Ruqayya, and the Prophet ﷺ asked his daughter, and she immediately accepted. Uthman ﷺ was in his low 30s, maybe about 30 years old. The Prophet ﷺ's daughter was in her early, just before she was 20, something along that line. He married her, and she loved him tremendously, and he loved her. He did not marry any other woman while they were, while she was his wife. And he treated her with absolute dignity and they became role models of how a husband and wife should be. Uthman radiallahu anhu suffered and Ruqayya suffered with the atrocities and the oppression of the people of Quraysh because they had become Muslims and followed the Prophet sallallahu So the Prophet peace be upon him gave permission for the Muslims to migrate to Abyssinia to the Christian king who treated people with justice and fairness and everybody was secure in his land in Ethiopia among the first who migrated was Uthman and Ruqayya with about 11 or 12 of them they migrated and they heard the news the fake news that the people of Mecca had embraced Islam there was fake news that happened long story so they came back when they arrived, they found that it was worse than the way they left it, and it was false news. So the persecution continued. When they migrated to Abyssinia, they had a child named Abdullah. They named him Abdullah. And so Uthman was called Abu Abdullah. And Ruqayya radiallahu anna, Ummu Abdullah. 
They loved their son, and their son grew until he was about six years old, the prophet's grandson. They only had one child. At the age of about six, they were in Medina by that time, and he died two years after his mother's death, Ruqayya, Abdullah. A rooster, it says that a rooster pecked his eye, it became infected, and it traveled through his bloodstream, and he died. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam grieved heavily over his grandson, Abdullah. And when he died, Abdullah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, found it difficult to get out of his house and walk to see his grandson dead. But then he went and he carried him and his eyes teared. And he made dua and buried him. Ruqayya and Uthman radiallahu anhum when they returned back from Abyssinia, from Ethiopia, the first thing Ruqayya did was she said, Aina Abi, where is my father? And they said to her, he's at the sacred house, the Kaaba, at the black rock. He was praying. And then she entered the, her father's home, her mother's home, Khadija radiallahu anha. Khadija is her mother. And she didn't find her mother. So she asked her sisters, where is my mother? Umm Kulthum, her older sister, her younger sister was sitting there and she went quiet. And Fatima radiallahu anha, the youngest, she started to cry and she ran out of the room. And that's when Ruqayya radiallahu anha knew that her mother Khadija radiallahu anha had passed away in her absence. She wasn't there to farewell her mother or attend her funeral. And again, when Ruqayya radiallahu anha died, her father, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was not there to farewell her and to attend her funeral. So while they were in Mecca, Ruqayya had lost her mother without seeing her. She was migrating because of persecution. They were living a tough life. In the cause of Allah. Then the migration to Medina happened. And Uthman radiallahu anhu and Ruqayya, they migrated. When they reached Medina, within about two years, the battle of Badr happened. We all know about the battle of Badr. It was a rejoiceful moment. The best time for the Muslims. The Prophet sallallahu had returned from the battle of Badr, rejoiced, and the Muslims were celebrating. Only to receive the news that his daughter Ruqayya had died. A little note here. Uthman radiallahu anhu, anhu did not participate in the first battle of Badr. And the reason he didn't participate was because Ruqayya radiallahu anhu was, became severely sick. And he asked the Prophet peace be upon him permission to stay back to look after and nurse his wife Ruqayya. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa gave him permission. And, Umar, and, and, and the Prophet ﷺ said to Uthman when he returned, he said, Oh Uthman, here is your share of the spoils of this war. For although you weren't with us physically, you are counted as if you were. For you wanted to be there, but your wife, my daughter, needed you. So you see, brothers and sisters, there is a balance in the religion and there are priorities. One man came to the Prophet ﷺ when he heard about another battle that were, they were going to participate in against the enemies. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I wish to go on this journey with you to fight and enter paradise. He said, is it paradise that you yearn for? Is it paradise that you are striving for? He said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. He said, alaka ummun, do you have a mother? He said, yes, Ya Rasulullah, she's still alive. He goes, go back to her and serve her feet. And that way, you will strive to paradise. A lot of people misunderstand this hadith. They think that paradise is beneath the mother's feet. That's wrong. It's not even a hadith. I think they're trying to interpret what the Prophet ﷺ said. It's a metaphor. Serve her feet means go and serve her. Be there for her. Help her, be around her in her life, 
and because of that, you will reach paradise. Another man, he said, Alaka abawan, do you have a father and a mother? He wanted to go on battle. And he said, yes. He says, how did you leave them? He said, I left them crying, Ya Rasulullah. He said, go back and make them laugh and smile until they are pleased before you go with me. So brothers and sisters, Islam is not, you know, black and white. It's not just about fighting and battling and as if there's no family, there's no social life, there's no reason or purpose in this life. No, Islam is a balance. And the last story I want to say is one of the companions, uh, Salman al-Farisi, radiallahu anhu, his religious brother, Prophet ﷺ, made brotherhood between them. His religious brother was Abu Darda, radiallahu anhu, both great companions. And they looked out for each other. So one day Salman al-Farisi arrives at the house of Abu Darda to go to the masjid with him or to do something. I wasn't sure. And his wife answered, and Salman al-Farisi noticed his wife wasn't in a good condition. She had ragged clothing. She looked like she hadn't eaten properly, malnourished. He said, where is my brother Abu Darda? And why are you in this state, Ya Umm Darda? She said, your brother Abu Darda is very busy with his Lord. Meaning, he hasn't got time for us and I'm patient. He's busy worshipping. So he went and brought him. And he said, tonight... We sleep, you know, together in the house. So Abu Darda was fasting that day, voluntary fasting, not Ramadan. And he said to him, here's food. I want you to break your fast and eat. And Abu Darda said, I want to fast. He said, break your fast. I'm inviting you. You know what the Prophet ﷺ said? That if you're invited, you should. It's a sunnah to break your fast if it's voluntary, if your brother invites you. But obviously Salman Farisi had a point. He wanted to teach him something. He broke his fast. That night... Abu Darda went to stay up all night. Salman al-Farisi said, go to sleep. He said, but I want to I do qiyam all night. He said, go to sleep and give your body some rest. Then he woke him up before Fajr. They prayed a bit of tahajjud and prayed Fajr. Then Abu Darda went to the Prophet wasallam and complained that Salman al-Farisi is not letting him worship the way he wants to worship. He said, what does Salman say? He says, Ya Rasulullah, Salman says to me, لِزَوْجِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقٍّ وَلِنَفْسِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقٍّ وَلِرَبِّكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقٍّ Your wife and your family has a right upon you. Your body has a right upon you. And your Lord has a right upon you. فَاعْطِي كُلِّ ذِي حَقٍّ حَقَّ Give each one of them their due right in balance. Don't take away from the others at the expense of others. This is Islam, my dear brothers and sisters. So Uthman radiallahu anhu did not leave to the battle of Badr and Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam counted as if he was there because he had to look after his sick, ill wife. And truly she died radiallahu anha. When Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam found out that she had died, he grieved heavily for her. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's a human. He grieved heavily. He did not witness her death. He did not witness her janazah, and he could not witness her burial. Radiallahu anha. And one day, after a little while, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sees Uthman radiallahu anhu. He's not himself. He's grieving, he's sad. And he was sitting, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, مَا لِأَرَاكَ حَزِينًا يَا Uthman. Why do I see you so sad, ya Uthman? And Uthman radiallahu anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, look at my state. How can I not grieve and be sad, Ya Rasulullah? For the daughter of my beloved Prophet, who was my wife, is no more. And I'm heartbroken. And I was your son-in-law. Now I'm no longer your son-in-law. That's broken off too, Ya Rasulullah. How can I not be sad? As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was speaking to Uthman radiallahu anhu, Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Prophet, peace be upon him. And the Prophet said to him, Ala ya Uthman, behold Uthman, this is Jibreel, he has just come to me, telling me that Allah orders me to marry you, my second daughter, Ummu Kulthum. 
And so Uthman radiallahu anhu married Umm Kulthum out of a divine revelation. His marriage was divine. Not, this is not just poetry or songs. This was truly divine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala married Umm Kulthum to Uthman radiallahu anhu. And the, the hadith is in Ibn Majah. He says, I did not marry Umm Kulthum to Uthman except by wahi from the heavens. That's what the Prophet sallallahu said. And the hadith is also is in is sahih, authentic, that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Oh Uthman, this is Jibreel telling me Allah has married you to Umm Kulthum with the same mahar as her sister. The hadith is also sahih Ibn Majah. Subhanallah, Umm Kulthum lived with Uthman radiallahu anhu for a while, but not very long, subhanallah. And he didn't have any children from her. And in the year 9 Hijri, so about seven years after the death of her sister and his first wife, Umm Kulthum radiallahu anha also passed away. She was only about in her mid to late 20s, very young. And so Uthman radiallahu anhu grieved yet once again. Umm Kulthum, one of the great Sahabiyat companions and the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But this time Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam attended her janazah and told them how to wash her for the burial and he went and buried her with his cousins Ali radiallahu anhu and uh, Al-Abbas who went into the grave and buried her. So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, my dear brothers and sisters, buried his wife, his children, his grandchildren, his own son who was two years old. He buried his uncles. He buried many people. And he used to say, if you fall into calamity and hardship, just think about me and hopefully your hardship will ease. Use me to ease your hardship, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say. After marrying these two, Uthman radiallahu anhu married another, I think, two other women, but they weren't significant until the day when Umar ibn al-Khattab was the Khalifa. And there was a third wife that he married who was the third most righteous after Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum. Her name was Naila. Naila, radiallahu anha. When he eventually married her, there's a nice story to it. There is a, nar a narration that is graded acceptable and narrated by Imam al-Bayhaqi in his hadith book and accepted by Ibn Hajar as an acceptable hadith that Naila was a Christian and now Uthman radiallahu anhu when he married her she was still a Christian for a little while and he taught her about Islam during their marriage life and she converted she reverted to Islam became a Muslim while married to Uthman radiallahu anhu and became a very devout very loyal very loving very enjoyable type of woman Enjoyable, I mean that she's, she, she, was, she was good to hang around with. She, was, uh, she could speak very well. She was funny. People found her, when they spoke to her, they, 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 they smiled. She was very loving to her husband. Uh, her presence was nice. And she was a very intelligent woman with great wisdom. So when they first got married, you have a woman who is very wise and intelligent, got a lot of self-respect, and you have a man, Uthman radiallahu anhu, who is shy and also very wise and has a lot of self-respect. On the night of their wedding, Uthman radiallahu anhu, he was about 60 years old. And she was in her mid-twenties. They used to get married very young in those days and there was age gaps weren't a problem at all in, in that society. At all. And what happened was, in the night of their wedding, he was sitting on one side of the, ha of the room and she was sitting on the other side facing each other. Neither of them is approaching the other. And Uthman radiallahu anhu happens to take off his turban. He had a turban, he took it off. And he was bald. No hair. 
He had lost his hair and become bald. And he became self-conscious in front of her. And he said to her, Look, I know I'm bald. But what is beyond this boldness is love in my heart and a great personality that you will enjoy very much. I'm a good husband. I'm a good man. You'll enjoy your life with me. I'll treat you well. She replied, saying, Oh no, Uthman, you happen to have married a woman who is a type of woman who loves men who are bold. I like, I'm attracted to bold men, and I like that. So he became eased, you know. He, and then he said to her, so he, he was happy with that, he said, would you like me to approach you, or would you like to come and sit next to me? It's consensual. <laughs> And she replied, I crossed vastness of deserts to get to you, to be with you. This small distance between me and you is nothing. I will come to you. And so she went, approached him, and sat next to him. So my brothers and sisters, this is how, it's nice to go into the, personal lives of these companions to see what it was really like, the human life. Because when we hear about their lives, we think about battles and conquering and swords and outside. No, 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 no. While all of this is happening, there is a real human life also happening, which is just as important as everything else. So for example, when the Prophet ﷺ was in the battle of Badr, or in the battle of Uhud, or in the battle of the Khandaq, within that time, there are very important practices that are practicing who people think are insignificant. He's teaching them how to make dhikr, how to drink water, how to... You know, it was, I think, in the Battle of Khandaq when he talked about um, not trying not to eat more than a third of your stomach full and not drinking more than a third and leaving some for air. He's talking about that while they're sieged and there's battles and war going on. Talking about little things like that that are very important now, Dean. So worship is everything, brothers and sisters. Everything you do at home, the way you enter your home, the little dhikrs that you say when you enter into your home with your right foot and you say salamu alaykum to people, even when you enter the bathroom and you say your dua, when you go to sleep and you say your dua, the way you talk, the way you walk, the way you sit, all of that is just as important. All of that is part of worship. So Uthman radiallahu anhu's life, a nice little introduction to that, subhanallah. They loved each other very much, his last wife. That was his last wife, Naila. And they lived for nearly 20 years together. And she loved, she loved him very much. She lived with him with absolute dignity. She was treated with respect and comfort. Till the day he was murdered. And he was murdered in front of her. And she tried to defend him. While his murderer came in with the sword into their house. And we're going to come to that story in our next lesson, inshallah. But I'll just give you a little snippet here, since we're talking about this last wife of his. Now, let's show you the relationship and how they struggled together. So she lived with him until he was murdered in front of her. And the man who came in, he was an extremist Muslim. Extremist Muslim. Yes, they existed. And that's when they started. They started... At the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu, extremist Muslims used to pop up like that. And he went in to murder Uthman radiallahu anhu, and she put her hand up while he's reading the Quran to try and stop the sword. He's telling it to stop. So she put, just reflexed, reflexes. She put her hand in front of her husband radiallahu anhu, and the man did not care. He chopped her fingers off and killed. Uthman radiallahu anhu. So, Naila is known for that, and, and there's a big story that's going to come up, inshallah, from here, about how he died and why, what happened, and then how it dragged on to the next Khalifa, Ali radiallahu anhu. So, everything has a connection. Inshallah, we'll get to it. And such was the life of his marital life, radiallahu anhu. He had many children, and uh, I think it was nine in his life. And they were all righteous and God-fearing. My dear brothers and sisters, Uthman radiallahu anhu, he was 
the man of generosity whose wealth did not stand in his way of love to the Prophet وسلم, who did not get arrogant because of his wealth and I have a little hadith about this about people who are wealthy so the muhajirun, the migrants and Uthman Adilana was one of the migrants some of the migrants who went from Mecca to Medina they became destitute, they became poor they were stricken with poverty when they migrated because their whole homeland and their wealth was left behind and they approached the Prophet ﷺ one day and said to him, ذهب أهل الدثور بالدرجات العلا والنعيم المقيم يصلون كما نصلي ويصومون كما نصوم ولهم فضل من أموال يحجون ويعتمرون ويجاهدون من أموال ويتصدقون. They said, Ya Rasulullah, we've gone poor. And the rich people, the people of, uh, who have a lot of wealth, they're praying like us, they're fasting like us, they're donating like us, and on top of that they have wealth which they use in the cause of Allah for hajj, for jihad, for charity. They're doing more than us, Ya Rasulullah. Why are they saying that? That was the nature of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. They did not compete in anything worldly. The only thing they competed in was anything for the hereafter. And this is what Allah says in Surah Al-Waqi'ah. وَفِي ذَلِكَ فَلْيَتَنَافَسِ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ And in this, those who want to compete should compete. This is what you compete in. In the hereafter. So they came up to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, they're beating us. We're doing everything, they're doing everything we're doing. On top of that, they've got wealth and they're using it. They're beating us into paradise. They're getting higher levels with their wealth. SubhanAllah, the difference. For Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to them, ألا أعلمكم شيئا تدركون به من سبقكم وتسبقون به من بعدكم He said do you want me to teach you something to do that you will beat them and those before you and you'll also beat anyone who comes after you They said yes يا رسول الله And then he said ولا يكون أحد أفضل منكم إلا من صنع مثلها مثل ما صنعتم and nobody can be better than you except those who do exactly what you do. They said, Yes, Ya Rasulullah. He said, Say Subhanallah. Say Alhamdulillah. Say Allahu Akbar 33 times after each Fard Salat. Your five daily prayers. And then, in another hadith it says, and finish it with one, one more Allahu Akbar. Or with La ilaha illallah, that's a hundred. That's all you have to do. And then, they did that. When they came back to the Prophet وسلم, they said, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, Sami'a ikhwanuna, ahlul amwali bima fa'alna, fa'alu mithla. Ya Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, the wealthy people found out what we're doing. So they started copying us and doing the same thing. <laughs> The Prophet ﷺ then said, ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ يُؤْتِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءَ I can't do anything about that. This is the provision and the goodness and the blessings that Allah gives it to whomever He wills. The hadith is in Muttafaq Ali Bukhari and Muslim. So my brothers and sisters, whether you have wealth or you don't have wealth, there is always a way, insha'Allah, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made everything in our deen, worship easy, for free. You don't need wealth to reach high places. And if you do, you use your wealth for worship as well, and you look after yourself. Nothing wrong with enjoying your life. Rasul ﷺ did say in the hadith that there are three things in life that a person finds goodness in and happiness. He said, uh, when he was talking to the men, that is, and same with the woman, he said, a righteous wife, that when he looks at her, he feels pleasure, he feels happiness. Let me just in, make that clear. When he looks at her, not, he didn't say physically, meaning you like her looks. It means when he, when he sees her, he finds comfort. You know, she makes him forget his worries. <laughs> he, he's got his, all his competition outside, comes home, and his wife makes him feel re-energized, nice, happy again. It's his retreat, and a wife who feels like that with her husband. So he said that's the first form of happiness in this life. This is one of the happinesses. The second one is a spacious home, so that he can treat his guests well in a spacious home. And he said a good vehicle or a ride. 
a ride in those days was like a camel or a horse. So something that's reliable to take you from place to place, like a reliable car and a good car, for example. These three things help a person with some happiness in life because they give you security, they give you strength, they help you in life. My brothers and sisters, Uthman radiallahu anhu talking about his generosity and his wealth, he was among the top most generous people. Last time we spoke about this well. It was called the well of Roma. The well of Roma. And this well was in Medina, owned by a Jewish man. And the Muslims were in strife. Obviously the people of Medina, they were farmers. And that's how they made their wealth and they needed water. And that was desert. So the well was huge. And his Jewish man wasn't sharing with anybody. He was charging big money. Nothing against the... You know, we're talking about all Jews, but he was a Jew, happened to be a Jew, was, who was very stingy. And he said, I don't want to give anyone. I want to make money off this. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam offered this man to buy the well and he charged a huge price. No one could afford it. And he knew nobody could afford it. So... Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sat in the masjid and with him was uh, Ali radiallahu anhu, Az-Zubayr, Talha, a few other companions. And he said, whoever buys the well of Roma for the Muslims, so in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the poor and the needy, the Muslims who are living there, Allah will forgive all his sins and will give him in its place in paradise. When Uthman radiallahu anhu heard about this, he rushed to the masjid, and there was Ali and the rest, and he said, is it true what the Prophet sallallahu said? They said yes. So he said, I ask you by Allah, did the Prophet peace be upon him say that? They said yes, and he said, I make you all witness that I have purchased it for the, for the Muslims in the cause of Allah. And he said also to the Prophet وسلم, will I get a well in Jannah, O Messenger of Allah? And the Prophet وسلم, said, oh yes, Ya Uthman. The hadith is in Fathul Bari, which is Bukhari. At first, Uthman radiallahu anhu, could not buy the whole well because the Jewish man wouldn't sell him the whole well. He sold him half of it. He sold him half of it for 12,000 dirhams, which is a lot of money today. Probably uh, something close to $40,000 or $20,000. And then the Jewish man found out that the Muslims are using up half of it too much and he's not able to sort of have access to it as easy as he wanted to. In the end, he just got, couldn't be bothered and he sold the rest of the well, the rest of it for 8,000 dirhams, so 20,000 dirhams. And Uthman radiallahu anhu paid for it, what is approximately to 40,000 US dollars. That was a huge, huge amount those days. It's like saying uh, $4 million or so. 1,500 years later, my dear brothers and sisters, today it is still called Bi'r Uthman, the well of Uthman. It is about 500 meters distance from the Prophet Sallallahu mosque and it is protected by the Ministry of Agriculture in Saudi Arabia. And it continues to supply water for the lands around them and for those who are in need. And it's called a waqf. So it is, no one's allowed to touch it. It's still a sadaqa that is ongoing for Uthman radiallahu anhu for the past 1,500 years. La ilaha illallah. Bi'r Uthman. My dear brothers and sisters, there was also a time when the Prophet ﷺ was going to the battle of Tabuk. Tabuk was when they had to fight the Romans. It was a heavy battle. They're now the superpower of the world. And what happened was that the army that went, it was almost all the men of Medina. And they struggled so badly that they have a name. They were called Jaysh al-Usra, the army that was destitute, very hard. They nearly died of starvation and thirst. It was very, very hard, called Jaysh al-Usra. 
And uh, the Prophet وسلم, he asked the believers and the Muslims to come and help and donate to prepare the army against the Romans because the Romans were causing trouble too much. Uthman radiallahu anhu comes along and he donates 950 camels, 60 horses, 1,000 cavalries, which is approximately 70,000 US dollars today. I did the calculations. And he donated 1,000 dinars, which is equivalent to 220,000 US dollars today in cash. The Prophet وسلم, the hadith is in Tirmidhi, Sunan al Tirmidhi, it's authentic. He said, they said, we saw the Prophet وسلم, turning the gold dinars that Uthman came and just dropped in front of him. He dropped them, and they all went all over the floor. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they said, we saw him turning the gold coins around with his fingers, and he was shocked. And he was saying, مَا ضَرَّ عُثْمَانُ مَا, ب- ما فَعَلَ بَعْدَ الْيَوْمِ مَا ضَرَّ عُثْمَانُ مَا فَعَلَ بَعْدَ الْيَوْمِ Nothing will harm Uthman after this day, no matter what he does. Nothing will harm Uthman after this day, no matter what he does. Subhanallah. Who are we talking about, man? These are people beyond this world. Even at the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, yet again we see Uthman coming to the rescue. In a time when they saw a huge caravan coming in from Sham, from Syria into Medina. And the Muslims were struggling at the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. The Muslims were apostated. The Muslims weren't paying the zakat anymore. It was, it was, it was terrible. So Abu Bakr anhu knew as the Khalifa, Muslims needed help. And when they saw this huge caravan, this was like a lifesaver for the Muslims. So the Muslim merchants of Medina, they went to offer, they went to ask, whose caravan is this? We will buy it and give it to the Muslims who are in need. They said, it is Uthman ibn Affan's caravan. See, he, he traded in textiles and he traded in all these all different things. So the merchant said, we will give you, O Uthman, for every 10 dirhams, 12 dirhams. So if you've paid 10 dirhams for something or if you charge 10 dirhams for a merchandise, we are offering you 12 dirhams for it, each, each product. And he said to them, لَقَدْ أُعْطِيتُ أَكْثَرْ I've been offered more. They said, all right, we'll give you 50 dirhams for every 10 dirhams that you have put up for sale. He said, I've been offered more, more. Give me more. And that's how tradesmen work. Then they said, we will give you double, double, like 200% profit. For everything. He said, I have been given even more. They said, what more? This is all the merchants of Medina. None of us put together can afford more than 200% profit. Then he said, Allah gave me 10 folds for each dirham. Can you? So a thousand, a thousand percent profit. Because Allah does say in the Quran, Ashri amthaliha, Allah will give you for each sadaqah ten folds. Wait, and He will increase it to seventy or more for whoever He wills. And so Uthman radiallahu anhu said, Take it. It is all for the sake of Allah for the Muslims. So Uthman radiallahu anhu was amazing in that sense, and money never meant anything to him except that he made it by the will of Allah and he donated it and used it everywhere he could. My dear brothers and sisters, then there came a time when Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw a dream. He saw a dream that the key of the Kaaba was given to him. And that he and his companions were going to Mecca to perform Hajj and Umrah. 
He woke up and he said to the Muslims, the companions, I have seen this dream and this is a promise from Allah that we are going to re-enter, reclaim our homes in Mecca and Allah is going to give us control over it. We're going to take it over. And we are going to Umrah and Hajj. The Muslims rejoiced and they said, Allahu Akbar, we're going to conquer back Mecca, our homeland, our place. Our... He said, yes. But he didn't tell them when. And the Muslims around them, companions thought that this is the year. Because they had been away. Remember, they got kicked out. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then said, this year we will go to Umrah. And it was in Dhul Qa'dah. So 11th month of Hijrah. He got his ihram. And he got himself ready. And nearly all the companions in Medina left with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, there was about 1,400 companions that year who left with the Prophet Sallallahu from Medina to do their Umrah in Hajj. Eh, sorry, in Mecca. He said, Inni Mu'tamir, I'm going to do Umrah. And all they took with them was one sword each. And that was a custom with the Arabs. They have to take one sword with them because they're going to the desert to survive. But that didn't mean, this means that they're not going for war but only if they needed it. So Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went, and when they reached close to Mecca, the people of Mecca, the leaders of Mecca who hated the Muslims and wanted to kill them, wanted to annihilate them, they heard about the news. And they convened a meeting together, the leaders of Quraysh, of Mecca, and they said, we will not let them enter under any cost. But they can't fight them, Heron, because... There's a story, that, so whoever, looks, whoever the custodians of Mecca were, all the Arab tribes around them, you know, they looked, at, they looked up to them. They're not allowed to prevent anyone from coming into that sacred place. So they had to devise a plan of how to keep them out. But they were ready never to let them in, no matter what it costs. When the Prophet ﷺ and his companions reached a, few, a, few, a bit of a distance away from Mecca, they sat and camped for a little while to see what's going to happen. The Meccan leaders, they wanted to negotiate. But there were a bunch of youth, young, zealous, emotionally driven young men from Mecca who react with their egos and chivalry. They exist still till today, young people whose emotions and their zealous takes over, but they don't think very well. So they fall into predicaments. So want to jump egotistic. These were egotistic young men. They said, we will not let them enter. They put their swords and they raced, galloped on their horses. There was about 70 or 80 of them. And they rushed to the camp of the Prophet ﷺ, the companions, to kill them and tell them to get out. But unfortunately for them, the tables turned. And the companions of the Prophet ﷺ captured them and brought them hostage. All 70 to 80 of them. Not one of them was able to even hurt one single companion. What did the Prophet ﷺ do to those 70 to 80? He brought them and he freed them. And he said, you're going back. For I did not come here for a war or a battle. Rasul ﷺ went for a negotiation and for a peace treaty. Then he came to Umar anhu and said, Ya Umar, you were the ambassador of Mecca. Go to Mecca, to the leaders, and try to negotiate with them a peace treaty so that we can do our Umrah and return. But Umrah radiallahu anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, please forgive me. If I go in, I don't have any clan, any family to protect me. Not because of that, but because the leaders will not respect what I have to say. My words won't get anywhere. However, I suggest Uthman. Send Uthman in to negotiate with them. For he has a strong clan there and he will be respected. And they all love him anyway. So the Prophet ﷺ approached Uthman and he said to him, Ya Uthman, go to them and try to negotiate with them a peace treaty so that we can do our Umrah. Also invite them to Islam if they wish. And there are Muslims in there who are Muslims in secret and they're still scared. Go to them and tell them that Allah has promised them 
that they will be free and Mecca will be taken over by the Muslims soon. So Uthman radiallahu anhu went in and the Muslims waited. When Uthman arrived, he did exactly as the Prophet sallallahu said, but they refused to let the Prophet, peace be upon him, and companions enter. So they said to Uthman, listen Uthman, you're a good man. We're not going to let your Prophet come in, but we offer you to go and do your Umrah. You can go and do your Tawaf out of courtesy. What did Uthman radiallahu anhu say to them? He said, no, wallah, I will not make tawaf without the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa beside me. I won't do it without him. So they got angry at that, and they detained him. They detained him because they wanted to put fear with the Muslims, and they wanted to make a statement. Now the rumor got out to the Muslims that they had killed Uthman, radiallahu anhu. And so the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa he became moved by this and he went to a nearby tree. Under that tree, the Prophet Sallallahu sat and he called his companions. He said, Wallahi, I will not leave this place until I have avenged Uthman radiallahu anhu. Either victory or death. Who is with me? Among them was a companion. And this companion was from the Ansar. And his name was Abu Sinan Al Asdi or Al Asadi. He comes up to the Prophet. And he places his hand with the Prophet or places it on it. And he said, I will pledge allegiance with you, Ya Rasulullah, on this. He said, on what? He said, victory or death. And then the other companions all came along. Abu Bakr, Umar, Ali, Abu Ubaidah. All the companions were there. And among them they said there was one woman as well. And the Prophet Sallallahu wife, Umm Salama. She was with him as well. And all of them pledged allegiance with the Prophet Sallallahu under that tree. All 1,399 approximately, except one man. He did not pledge allegiance. That man, they say his name was Jad Ibn Qais. And he was a hypocrite. He exposed himself that day. He was a spy. He did not pledge allegiance. He hid behind the horse. A couple of people saw him. And they all pledged allegiance with the Prophet ﷺ to victory or death to avenge Uthman radiallahu anhu. All their hands came forward except for the hand of who? Uthman. Uthman was not there to pledge allegiance with the Prophet ﷺ. Rasul ﷺ then brought his own hand, his right hand, and placed it on top of his own hand and said, This hand is on behalf of Uthman. Rasul ﷺ used his own blessed hand to represent the hand of Uthman radiallahu anhu. And this account is in the Quran. It's in Surah Al-Fatih, chapter 48, verse 18, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it's an amazing, tremendous verse. لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ يُبَايِعُونَكَ تَحْتَ الشَّجَرَةِ فَعَلِمَ مَا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ فَأَنزَلَ السَّكِينَةَ عَلَيْهِمْ فَأَنزَلَ السَّكِينَةَ عَلَيْهِمْ وَأَثَابَهُمْ فَتْحًا قَرِيبًا Allah was much pleased with the believers when they swore Felty to you under the tree. He knew what was in their hearts, so he bestowed inner peace upon them and rewarded them with a victory near at hand. Brothers and sisters, this is not just a pledge. This is not just placing their hands on top of the Prophet's hands. These people had no business. They, 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 they could have just all run away from the Prophet. They had no nothing to lose. Nothing. In the middle of nowhere. And the disbelievers in Mecca could have killed them and their, and their entire families and wiped them all off. Yet, they were ready 
to fight till death and to pledge in the middle of that plain land. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that these companions who pledged allegiance under the tree, it's a very, very famous story, iconic one. Allah is pleased with them. It means that Allah is pleased with them forever. Every single companion that day. Not temporarily, forever. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the future. And it is only a person with lack of intelligence who would think that Allah would be pleased with them temporarily or he would mention them in the Quran for all people to read for till the end of time, till we read it till today. And then to say that no, some of those companions were bad. Some of those companions were hypocrites. Some of those companions were going to go against the Prophet and the Khulafa. All of them pledged allegiance and they are called Ahlul Shajara, the companions of the tree. And this is the Sunni belief, alhamdulillah, and it is the correct and truthful one, which is consistent with the entire story and with all the narrations, and it makes sense no matter which way you look at it. It's consistent linguistically, consistent with the context, consistent with all the stories that these Ahlul Shajara, where Allah was pleased with them. My dear brothers and sisters, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and the hadith is in, uh, narrated by Jabir, the source is Sunan al-Tirmidhi, hadith number 3860, and its grade is Hassan, Sahih, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا يدخل النار أحد ممن بايع تحت الشجرة. None of the companions who pledged allegiance under the tree will enter hellfire. This is the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But then Uthman radiyallahu anhu returns safely, and as soon as he returned, some men jokingly said to him, "Did you enjoy your tawaf?" around the sacred house of Abu Abdullah. They're jokingly and trying to find out as well. Uthman radiallahu became angry and said, what a terrible accusation by the one who possesses my soul. I refused to do tawaf until the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is with me. And they offered me and I said no. So they detained me. And the Muslims then said, Wallahi, the messenger of Allah is the most wisest and the one who judges the best. He judged Uthman radiallahu anhu in the most highest degree. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, such was Uthman radiallahu anhu. One day, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had the companion Abdullah ibn Umar with him. Abdullah, the son of Umar radiallahu anhu. He was still a bit young, maybe 16 years old. And he said to him, a man has passed us. A man just walked past. This man who is wearing headgear will be killed wrongfully and oppressively. Ibn Umar says, I looked and there was Uthman standing. The hadith is in Tirmidhi 8708-3708 and Musnad Ahmad 5953. Albani has graded it in good reliability. And such was Uthman. He was going to be killed oppressively and wrongfully. And when the Prophet ﷺ was on his deathbed, he was dying. He said to his companions, I wish to have some of my specific companions around me right now. They said to him, Ya Rasulullah, would you like us to get Abu Bakr? And he remained silent. Then he said, would you like us to get Umar? He remained silent. Then they said, would you like us to get Uthman? And the Prophet wasallam said, yes. When they brought Uthman to the Prophet wasallam when he was dying, he said to Uthman something and tapped on his leg, on his lap. And Uthman's face became pale. Then, later on, Uthman said, and the hadith is also narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha. She heard him when she was in the house saying, O Uthman, 
you will be subjected to a fitna of killing. You're going to be subjected soon to a fitna, a terrible tragedy around you, where lots of people are going to kill others, meaning the Muslims. Some of them will kill each other, and you are going to be subjected to killing yourself, meaning you're going to be, get killed. He said, when they come to kill you, do not fight or resist. Do not fight or resist them, but be patient. Don't take up arms against them. Uthman radiallahu says, when the day came, and they came to fight him, there were groups who wanted to cause fitna, we'll talk about it inshallah next class, they came to kill Uthman radiallahu anhu, and he said, I will not fight you. And Ali radiallahu anhu and other companions, they said, pick up arms and defend. He said, La wallahi, I will not fight the Muslims. And I will not be the first Khalifa for people to say that he killed his own Muslim companions. And he said, I promised the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam not to do so. I will be patient. The hadith is in Ibn Majah, number 113, and Ahmad 2325797. In another hadith in Musnad Ahmad, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, O Uthman, Allah will give you a shirt to wear. The shirt means position and leadership. If if the hypocrites tell you, if the hypocrites tell you to take it off, do not take it off. Meaning there's going to come a time in your leadership where they're going to tell you, get out of your leadership. Do not give up your post. He didn't tell him exactly what the leadership was. And insha'Allah we'll be talking about that. But just to end this lesson for today, Uthman ibn Affan's time was a time of amazing advancement in the time of the Muslims. Among the first things Uthman radiallahu anhu did when he became the Khalifa was that there was Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas who was a governor in Asham, and he had borrowed some money from the house of the Muslims, like from social security, he borrowed, and he was supposed to give it back on a certain date, but he was a bit late in giving it back, he wasn't able to repay it, only because of that, Uthman radiallahu anhu took him off his post, and said, I can't have you there, it's not haram, but I can't have you there as a role model, and that was among the first things he did radiallahu anhu, to show you how fair and just and true he was. Among the things Umar uh, Uthman radiallahu anhu did also, remember when I told you about the fire worshipper who killed and murdered Umar radiallahu anhu, Abu Lu'lu'ah? Well, what happened after that was Umar radiallahu anhu's son, Abdullah, he saw two Persian magans, two of them who were friends of Abu Lu'la who killed his father. And he saw the dagger that his father was killed with drop from the coat of one of them, dropped on the floor. He knew that that they were associates, so he jumped onto them and killed them both. The news got to Uthman radiallahu anhu, and they were meant to be residents, citizens of the Muslim land. And we all know that if a non-Muslim is living on the Muslim land, they're not to be harmed. They have, this, they have rights. But when he killed them, the news and the complaint came to Uthman radiallahu anhu. And Ali radiallahu anhu was a great judge. He said, one man's witness is not enough for the murder of these two people. Meaning that Abdullah will have to suffer the same judgment of anyone else because of the lack of witnesses. Only he saw the dagger. We can't take only his word. But the other companions disagreed with Ali. Uthman radiallahu anhu's nature was perfect for that time. Uthman was perfect for the disagreements among the Muslims. What was it? He was tender, patient, and always resorted to reconciliation. What was the best way? He always found a way to maintain the peace between them. This is not in every case, but in his time, that was the best move. So he resolved and said, 
I will pay from my own wealth the blood money to the families of these two victims. And so Abdullah was forgiven. Now we understand Uthman's Khilafah was based on him trying to keep the brotherhood between the Muslims. And within his time, they spread. And he ruled in the Khilafah for nearly 11 years or 12 years. And the fitna only happened in the last two years of his Khilafah. A lot of Muslims, they forget the 10 years of absolute peace and beauty and, 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 whatever, and, 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 and brotherhood and strength of the Muslims during his time. For they conquered Cyprus. And they were the first to cross the sea. Because Umar Dilanu, he said nobody's allowed to sail in sea because he was afraid for the soldiers. But in his time, Muslims became people who crossed the seas. And Cyprus surrendered to the Muslims in a peace deal that was made. And the Muslims protected the island, uh, the islands of, of, of Cyprus. And in fact, they became the protectors of the sea. They conquered North Africa. They conquered Sicily and the Mediterranean seas against Constantine, the new emperor of Rome. And after this battle with the Romans, the naval sea was in the power that was occupied by Muslims till the 16th century. The naval sea was in the power and control of the Muslims till the 16th century. Persia and Turkestan also was conquered because of the uprising against Muslims and the old emperor of Persia, whose name was Yazgird. So in the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu, there was great, great advancement, amazing innovation, amazing uh, times until about the 10th year of his Khilafah when what we call the civil war began between the Muslims. So inshallah, we're going to leave this one till our next class to talk about the intricate details, why it happened, how it happened, how could it have happened, and what did the companions of the Prophet do about it? And what did Uthman al do about it? And what was the end result? Jazakumullah khair. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.